Mr. Jazz Stevens, ladies and gentlemen, I am happily a UMBC alum. I believe I majored in college life, but they allowed me to have a degree in economics. <laughs> Just want to go ahead and formally thank everyone for coming out this afternoon. Um, I am floored by the display of such beautiful people in this room. I'm floored by the display of everyone here to lend their support to the individuals who molded and guided lost souls such as myself to a certain level of maturity and academic success. And hopefully we're going to propel this, teach the next generation of students and future leaders who will come out of UMBC. On behalf of the chapter of Black and Latino alumni staff and myself, I'm going to thank you once again for your attendance. I'm not going to labor this any longer. I want to introduce to you Dr. Tamara Lewis, class of 1992, and the Legends of Excellence event co-chairperson. She is also a current member of the CBLA, as well as a former member of the UMBC Alumni Association Board of Directors. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Tamara Lewis. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to the honorees, alumni, faculty, staff, students, and guests. As Jazz said, my name is Dr. Tamara Lewis, class of 1992, and it gives me great pleasure to take part in this awards brunch. I would like to begin this afternoon by addressing the reason that we're gathered today for the occasion. We've come to UMBC, we've come to, UMBC to celebrate and honor our legends of excellence. This event conceptualized by our very own Dr. Yvette Mosey Ross, class of 1988, and developed by the steering committee of which Yvette served as a member, is the first of its kind at UMBC. Held every five years, the first Legends of Excellence brunch was held in 2007, with the next brunch held in 2012. At this time, I would like to recognize our previous Legends of Excellence award winners in attendance. Please, call, please stand when I call your name. Ms. Betty Glasgow. Ms. Cynthia Hill. Ms. Bonnie Keith. Previous award recipients, another round of applause. For the 2017 Legends of Excellence brunch, a total of 12 nominations were received. And after careful consideration, the 2017 recipients were chosen by the selection committee. Our 2017 honorees are Mrs. Ernestine Baker. Dr. Willie Lamousse Smith, Mona Simmons, and Reverend Dr. Jamie Washington. We consider the award winners legends because of the indelible mark they have made on the lives of UMBC's African American and Latino students over the past 50 years. This awards brunch is our way of expressing our gratitude and recognizing them in a meaningful and significant way. We're especially pleased that today, our families, friends, colleagues, and former students are here to celebrate with our award winners. The honorees are considered trailblazers, heroes, mentors, role models, educators, pioneers, advisors, and friends who paved the way for us while we were students. They listened to us when others wouldn't. They motivated us to persist, 
even when UMBC, like many other institutions across the country, were dealing with issues of race. They shared their wisdom, they held our hands, they strategized with us, fought with us, and for us, educated us in, a, in dynamic and engaging ways, and helped us to believe that we could do anything we put our mind to. And ultimately, they made our time here at UMBC a very special and memorable time. The honorees represent a broad range of history and have collectively served UMBC for over 128 years. They are true reflections of grit and greatness, and their legacies live on in us and at, and at UMBC, not to be forgotten. Again, I thank everyone for attending today, and I hope that you enjoy our Legends of Excellence brunch. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Tamara Lewis. I would provide some type of long soliloquy as an introduction to our next speaker, but I don't believe it's necessary. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Robowski. Afternoon, even. <laughs> I am delighted to welcome you, Darren and, and Tamara. Both of you, really proud of you and what you're doing. I was especially proud when Darren was explaining to me that he is a federal regulator, so he goes around to banks to make sure they take care of our money. And, and so, give me my hand for helping us out. <laughs> Tamara Cohen is, is an outstanding educator and helping us in the state. Give her a hand, also. You know, it, I, I was so pleased when I heard our beloved Lamont's name and Lisa, who is here. Uh, it, it's special when we know people are never forgotten. Amen. When they are part of who we are, and as I said to Lisa, she's a part of our family, and I'm glad she's sitting at Ernie's table. It's beautiful. And then Bonnie Ty in the back, who helps us so much in mathematics. Give Bonnie another round of applause. And then two of my senior advisors, very young senior advisors, <laughs> Cynthia Hill and Betty Glass. So give them another round of applause. And for, for, for both of them and so many others, the symbolism is this, that many of you in this room began at UMBC and made a difference when the country was still trying to figure out if people of all races could come together with all students of all types having a fair chance to succeed. And in many ways, people with smiles on their faces today faced periods when there were many challenges, more than young people today can fully appreciate. But I know what people like Betty and Cynthia went through so that all of us could sit here today. Give them one more round of applause. And then we are so pleased to have our four honorees. Let me just say, starting with Simona, who was one of the first staff on this campus. She can definitely be called one of those founding mothers. Wherever you are, Simona, where are you? Somewhere, wherever. It's really, if you give her a hand, give her a hand. I mean, really. She talked recently at an event for our 50th about her experiences and the power of reading and what she had gotten from this experience. And I will never forget that speech. And so it's significant as you hear from her today and what she did. And then it's a big deal when somebody can leave your campus, be all over the country as an expert, and everybody still tells me wherever I go, do you know that guy, Jamie Washington? Do I know Jamie Washington? Do I know that Jamie? And so Jamie is a symbol of inclusive excellence. He's known all over the country. And I say, we call him everything he knows right there. <laughs> I'll just claim him that way. And then somebody who helped us years, even before my half, and was working in the financial aid office. Some people remember that time. But my fellow Hamptonian, and somebody who brought, for me, the spirit of Hampton to UMBC. Ernie Baker, would you please stand here? Yeah. Really? Yeah, I'm sure she was in the spirit of Hampton and Delta. She brought them both to UMBC. I know she did. You go there with both of them. And then finally, somebody that we call the old man, but it's the old, young, honorable man, 
a wonderful professor representing humanity, social sciences, and internationalism of our culture, uh, Willie Lemose Smith. Willie, where are you? Please come on. So there are many people today, and some of whom have retired recently, like Diane and Marilyn and all of those in the room. And we're here because we celebrate the idea of inclusiveness and the notion of African Americans and now more and more Latino students. And the best thing I can tell you, especially for those of you who are retired, is that the graduation rates of our students of color, black and Hispanic, are the highest on this campus. Give us a big round of applause. We're here today to celebrate the foundation laid by the people I just mentioned and all those they represent. And what you can think is this. Everybody looks to UMBC to say, how do you go about taking people from all kinds of backgrounds and elevating them and empowering them to be the very best? And so I challenge you, UMBC family, to watch our thoughts, they become words. Words become actions, actions become habits. Habits become character, but your character, it becomes your destiny. Welcome to UMBC. Dr. Bossy, thank you once again. We appreciate your presence here today. We're going to keep this party started, okay? Please join me in welcoming Ms. Cynthia Hill to the podium. Yeah. Ms. Hill is a former associate provost and director of UMBC Student Support Services. She is also one of the inaugural recipients of a Legends Award. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Cynthia Hill. Legends of Excellence Luncheon and to congratulate four dear colleagues who are being honored. Simona, Jamie, Ernie, and Willie B. <laughs> you are dear to me for more reasons than I can list in the time that I have been allotted. because I know much about your excellent work. I saw it. The work you have done for and on behalf of students speaks for you. And that work indeed lasts. The black and Latino students remember, they selected you for awards because of the good work that they know you did for them. You did the work for them individually and collectively. I join them in thanking you because after having worked with each of you and the 2007 and the 2012 legends for many years, I also commend you and thank you for the work that you have done over and over and over again. The work that you did behind the scenes on behalf of students. During UMBC's formative years, we worked on numerous institutionally sanctioned formal committees, such as the Commission on the Status of Women, the Affirmative Action Advisory Committee, the Committee on Minority Enrollment, the Individual Admissions Committee, search committees to fill numerous vacant positions. Students and many others know about that work. However, students have never known about much of the work that had to be done behind the scenes. 
We also work together in informal and ad hoc groups such as the Black Faculty and Staff Association that was formed to foster a supportive environment for minority students, faculty, and staff and to effect critical policy changes. Often we were not in positions to set policy or even to participate in the discussion. Much of that work had to be done at a restaurant or around someone's dining room table. But it got done, it made a positive difference, and our students not only survived, but thrived. It is worthy to note that 23% of the 13 legends selected to date have been from the Department of Africana Studies. Many are not aware of the significant role that the Africana Studies Department played in the lives of black and Latino students over many years. Yeah. Although the McNair Scholars Program has been open to all eligible UMBC students. Many have been members of underrepresented minority groups. Since the inception of the program in 1992, the Africana Studies Department has been the academic home for the McNair Research Course, and many faculty members have served as research mentors for McNair scholars. of the 13 legends, including Jamie and Willie, have served as McNair mentors. Wow. In addition to the legends who have been honored to date, many other members of the faculty and staff have contributed significantly to the success of UMBC's black and alumna students, and Latino students. I'm especially thinking today of my friend and colleague, Paula Ashby, mm -hmm. who was both a black alumna and a staff member. Paula passed away in February, and I'm wearing this little flower today in her memory. She graduated in 1976, and she worked for many years as an academic advisor to hundreds of students, particularly those who wanted to go to medical school. So many UMBC alumni who are physicians owe a debt of gratitude to Paula Ashby. It is a high honor for an educator to be chosen for recognition by students and alumni. There is a code among the legends that has never been written nor spoken aloud, but it always has been understood that each would do the best they could for the students. Simona, Jamie, Ernie, and Willie B, on behalf of the other legends, thank you for your service to students, and welcome to our group. presentation at this time. So please join me as we welcome Karen Sutton to present our first Legends of Excellence winner. Hello. Hello. My name is Karen Sutton. I earned a master's degree in history from here in 1997. I'm pleased to be here to recognize my friend, Simona Simmons. In 1990, and sorry, in 1966, 
Simona Simmons began working at Alvin O. Kuhn Library the same year UMBC admitted its first students. She has worked here and served students and the campus community for 50 years. While working here, Simona took advantage of the free education her job provided. In 1974, she received her bachelor's degree in American Studies. Enjoying the experience, she continued her education, pursuing a master's degree of library science and information services. She also received a Master of Arts in American Studies in 1976 at College Park. For many years, Simona was the only librarian of African American descent. This gave her many opportunities to be seen by and interact with African American students. Positions she has held include Head of Circulation, if somebody borrowed a VHS tape, <laughs> I know I'm dating myself, <laughs> a CD or DVD, she was there. As head of reserves, students may have interacted with her to obtain a particular book, journal, or tape, which their professors had set aside for a class. Simona was also in charge of acquiring and maintaining various scholarly magazines, journals, and newspapers when she was head of the serials department. If a student, faculty, or staff member needed one of these, she was responsible. And she was there. No doubt Ms. Simmons made sure there was good representation of works by African American authors. Finally, as head of the reference department, she was ever present to answer a myriad of questions, either personally or by directing them to another source. Simona's current role is that of service and special projects librarian. She also serves as faculty liaison to the Africana Studies Department. Still, as always, she enjoys working with students. Outside of UMBC, she serves her community as a former adjunct faculty member at UMCP's College of Information Studies. For y'all lay folk, that's librarian school. <laughs> she has written for several academic publications, including the Handbook of Black Librarianship, Notable Black American Women, and the Encyclopedia of American Gospel Music, among others. Simona also wrote the essay, It's a Personal Thing for library mosaics. Finally, she has been a board member for the Anne Arundel County Public Library and the Oncology Foundation of Maryland and the District of Columbia. Simona shares that she always loved working with students. As they discover new information and mature, it is exciting to contribute a small part to their success. She says they bring joy and excitement to her job. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to some and introduce to others, Ms. Simona Simmons.
thank you all. I am deeply moved. And if any of you know me, I particularly am a little, sometimes a little lost for words when I'm put in the spotlight. But anyway, I'm grateful to all of you that have taken the time to come out and share this event. I want to thank uh, particularly Professor Sutton, who is so persistent. She would not give up. And I thank you to the association. And I'm also honored to be in the company of my favorite people, some of my favorite people. I want to say that there are times we sometimes we just continue to work and we think nobody pays any attention. But I've always loved the students and I always try to do my best. And one thing that comes to mind is Maya Angelou. I don't know if you remember this expression. She says, sometimes you may not remember what people do. You may not remember what people say, but you always remember how they make you feel. And thank you for making me feel so great today along with the other honorees. And I want to say to the young students, there's no mountain too high to climb. As long as you have God, and as long as you prepare yourself, read and invest your time. May God bless each of you. to thank CBLA and to the Office of Institutional Advancement for making this event happen and giving us an opportunity to express our gratitude to the faculty and staff who helped us follow our dreams. I also want to make a little commercial. I really want to thank Danielle Bruce for making this thank event you. happen. some students and she's like are you bringing them not bringing them and she was very patient so thank you for making this happen I also want to recognize a couple of potential students that we I brought today real quick um, and just want them to say hello I'm hoping that they will choose to come to UMBC Woo! and now to Dr. Washington um, the one man that completely changed my life uh, Dr. Washington and his biography, one of the things that he mentions that is that he lives by the words of this song. If I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a song or with a word or song, if I can show somebody that he's traveling wrong, then my living shall not be in vain. I had the privilege of meeting Dr. Washington as an undergraduate student and while serving as a leader to the Hispanic and Latino Student Union. Dr. Washington's incredible personality and leadership gave me the guidance I needed to explore and learn what it means to be a leader. More importantly, he taught me the responsibility that came with the title leader. In 1998, as I was ready to complete my undergraduate degree in social work, 
Dr. Washington, provided me the opportunity to become a graduate assistant in the Office of Student Life. It was then that I really got to know Jamie. He may not be aware, as I mentioned, that he changed my life, but I would not have been able to complete my master's degree without his support and guidance. Under his leadership, I had the opportunity to work with student leaders from diverse backgrounds and experiences. And what I gained primarily from, what Jamie, from Jamie was what he calls authenticity. He taught me about making meaningful and authentic connections with people from all walks of life. And for that, I am most grateful. I could spend hours sharing all of his personal and professional education and religious accomplishments. I actually brought a copy of his Bible, it's about 20 pages long. <laughs> um, he is quite impressive. But I really, what I wanted to share was more about the difference that he made in all of us individually. He has made a difference in hundreds, if not thousands of students. And what stands out for me is his commitment and tireless efforts to improving the lives of students everywhere that he goes. As Dr. Hrabowski mentioned, he's known everywhere now, yeah. all over the United States. There are many challenges for students of color, particularly Latino and African American students. And Jamie, Jamie's door was always open. It didn't matter what he was doing at work. If you were having a bad day and if you wanted to talk, he was always there for all of us. He's still there for me today. He was actually just attending my wedding last year. Uh, Jamie was always available to offer wisdom, counsel, encouragement, kind words. And he also helped work tirelessly to open dialogue and to help us navigate challenging issues relating to diversity, race, gender, socioeconomic status, sexuality, social justice, and, social, and so, so much more. He has helped all of us navigate through life. One of my co-nominators, Mr. Jack Stevens, in our event MC, said this regarding his impact on student life and Greek life. Dr. Washington is referenced by students and faculty alike with reverence and respect. His actions demonstrate the integrity for which, is, for, for which he is known for. While a student, he served as advisor to my fraternal brothers and his leadership council and friendship left lasting impressions on many young men. He was instrumental in helping us mature and shaping our development. His accessibility to mentor young men, despite numerous responsibilities, afforded us and me, in particular, the privilege of exercising the wisdom and counsel he offered. Thank you, Jamie, for all you've done for me and countless UMBC students. Your legacy, commitment to us, will never be forgotten. And now I present to you, Reverend Dr. Jamie Washington. <laughs> a mic and three minutes. <laughs> Especially when there is so much to say. Uh, I am so humbled and so honored as I stand here today. So I first want to honor the divine energy, love, and light that I call God. I want to honor Native and Indigenous people whose land we stand on. I want to honor the ancestors who helped us to build this space and make it possible for all of us to be here. I honor my legacy, my grandparents, Thurman and Elizabeth Williams, and Lucille and John Washington, my parents, Annette and James Washington. I say thank you for giving me life and teaching me what it means to live. I invite their presence into this space at this time. I honor those who have gone before us. I am so grateful to be amongst the legends who have gone before us 
who made me what I am today. And so please join me in appreciating all of the former legends. Thank you for naming my brother, Lamont Talber. Yeah. Yeah. My sister, Paula Ashby. Yeah. And all those, my, my brother, George Preisinger, and all those who we not, may not be with us in physical presence today. I don't want to be up here too long, but I am so grateful um, to be in this space. It is so honoring as I look out and see what UMBC represents to me as family. And so I see family in the building. I see my biological family, my sons, my sisters, my partner, my world. I see my church family who's in the building, who are the reasons that I'm able to move about the country and do the things that I'm able to do. And today, in particular, I see my UMBC family. <laughs> um, 31 years ago, I was trying to get out of the wilderness. Um, and the wilderness was, you know, many of us have to do our time in little, small, predominantly white towns. <laughs> And I found my way to this place I had not heard of, UMBC, as I was preparing to do my doctoral work at College Park. I came and uh, I was met by <coughs> Dr. Willie B. and Simone Simmons and Ernie Baker, who was in financial aid. We've got a long story. I'm so glad to see our husband, my frat brother here. We've got stories about when we first met, but we can't do all that today. Um, Betty Glasgow and Cynthia Hill, all who mean so much to me. I'm thankful for who I met when I got here and who started this space with me, Dr. Nancy Young, within three days of each other in June of two. 1986. And so as I look out and I see, and I'm honored that one of my graduate assistants, Dr. Yvette Mosey Ross, is the one who started this event. I look and I see Jessica Contreras, who's gone on and brought more students back to this space, because that's what we do. I can't call all the names, because my UMB sat UMBC family is in the house. I do want to honor the man who set this place ablaze, who when I said, and I went into his office and I said, Doc, um, I think I need to answer the call to ministry and I have to go off to seminary. He said, of course. I said, of course that's what you have to do. And I said, I just need to make sure I keep my health care. <laughs> and so I was taking a leave of absence to make sure that I had heard really from God and not just had some bad pork that night. So I just needed to make sure I could keep my health care. <laughs> he said, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. And I left the UMBC and I went to Howard University to do the next round of the work. And so what I want to say is thank you. Thank you all for continuing to be with me. And so while I have left UMBC, UMBC has never left me. It is permanently and forever will be in my spirit and my energy. Jessica named the words that I try to live by every day. And that is, if I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word or song, if I can show somebody that he, she, they, there, or them have traveled wrong, then my living shall not be in vain. So on this day, to my other legends who made it such that my living is not in vain, I want you to know that your living is not in vain. 
to the students who made it possible for me to be here. You are my legends. Then my living shall not be in vain. No, my living shall not be in vain. If I can help. Somebody, as I pass along, then my living shall not be in vain. Yeah. two award recipients and once again say thank you to Tuba. Let's take a moment and enjoy a performance of our very own gospel choir. All right.
have is Savannah Curtis. Give another round of applause to that gospel choir. Um, it, it, Pastor Jamie, I think your take home message was uh, listen to God, but keep your health insurance. <laughs> um, so I live in DC, so I, I need you all, the rest of you all out there in the other 50 states, to uh, call your senators to, to help us keep that message along. Um, <laughs> My name is Maceo Thomas, and uh, it's an honor to present Ernestine Baker as a legend of excellence. I'm a 1993 graduate of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County with a degree in biochemistry and molecular biology, and I was in the first class of the Meyerhoff Scholarship Program. Yeah. The Meyerhoff Program is often described as a family. Many, fa many families, not all families, many families have a father and a mother. Earlier, we heard from the father of the Meyer Hall program, Dr. Rubowski. Outside the house, dad is the face of the family. However, as we all know, inside the home, mom makes the magic happen. <laughs> Mrs. Baker is the mother of the program. This is who the kids go to when you're out of milk and all you wanted was a bowl of cereal. <laughs> Moms help us create options so we are fed every single day. Moms are who you go to when you have a problem with another kid in your class. She's your encourager when you're not sure and builds you up so you can head back out the house with your head held high. The group of young men starting uh, the Meyerhoff program in 1989 with me, we got to be Mrs. Baker's first set of sons. She and Mr. Baker already had, uh, were very well versed with raising daughters. Mrs. Baker was the backbone of our support system as the Meyerhoff program bloomed and we all together began to realize what we had gotten into. <laughs> Just like all families, we often had rifts. Many of my earlier classmates, including myself, made choices that didn't always lead to a PhD in science, engineering, or mathematics. However, I always knew Mrs. Baker was my champion. I'll never, I'll never forget that she, along with her husband and one of her daughters, came to my parents' house to see me off when I left for my Peace Corps experience service a couple years after I graduated from UPC. She came as a friend and join my Thomas family with her continued support. I will always treasure her. Mrs. Baker was also a rock to so many black staff members here at UMBC. Tracy Collins, she'll always be Tracy Collins to me, nominated Mrs. Baker with the following words. Mrs. Baker embodies the theme of grit and greatness. With grace and savvy, she navigated the new territory and systems connected to birthing and nurturing the Meyerhoff program. She was very determined and had a steely will. She, not, she did not bow to the naysayers, challengers, or pitfalls. She constantly walked with dignity and insisted on excellence. Her walk was a model for all the staff and students under her wing. Many African Americans succeeded because she did not give up and because she held us to a standard of excellence, despite, despite our circumstances or where we came from. In fact, she held us up because of our circumstances and where we came from. We will forever be in debt to her. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my distinct honor to present a legend 
my UMBC mother, and my friend, Ernestine Becker. time 
and golfing 99%. <laughs> always encouraged me to be all that I want to be and do all that I want to do, for I have always had his love and support. He never made me feel badly or guilty about the long hours and times being away from home and my family. We have two daughters, Erica Roberts, who is successful in marketing for some of pharmaceutical company. Leslie Baker, tenured faculty in sociology at Chicago State University. Their husbands, Giada Kimmins, Lewis Roberts, four grandchildren, Bailey, Reese, Layla, and Morgan. A wonderful group of grandchildren, noisy, active, challenging, but we have a blast when we are together. Again, I repeat, this is bigger than me. Who else helped me? Professionally at UMBC, my transformation occurred during, with the inception of the Meyerhoff Scholars Program. Four individuals who inspired me, Robert and Jane Meyerhoff, Freeman and Jackie Rabowski. And they're committed to changing how we see underrepresented minorities in science and how underrepresented minorities see themselves as leaders in science. For some of the students, I realized this was foreign to them. Many had not thought of getting a PhD or master's degree MD, PhD, medical degree, that was beyond their reach. But through the encouragement of the Meyerhoffs and the Rybalskis, I could hear them saying at times to the students, you can do this. Hold fast to your dreams. How can I help you? Let me help you find your way. As a legend now, a part of my story, a part of my story to you is I am eternally filled with an overwhelming joy that our lives cross. And for your trust in me, in directing the Meyerhoff Scholars Program, thus allowing me my print. This is bigger than me. I would not be here today also without the support and dedication of faculty. For me, they do more than teach. They inspire, motivate, and help carve the path students need to take. I continue today to enjoy my personal relationships. <clears throat> Who helped me? You can't imagine the joy I feel seeing my other family, the Meyerhoff staff. My friends were here. People whom I I worked with prior to Meyerhoff days, UMBC staff, my Delt sisters, some of my line sisters are here, my church family, my UMBC adopted daughters. You know who you are. This is better than me. This is bigger than me. I feel the spirit of Lamont Tolliver. We were often described as good cop, bad cop. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa, for being here today. No, it's not about me. What joy I have, I feel, having Tracy Drummond nominate me for the Legends Award. She put up 
with me as a student worker, and when she graduated, was hired as a Meyer Hall staff member. And we used to play some tricks on Lamont, didn't we? Yeah. So, if it is not about me, well then who? It is about the over thousand Meyer Hall scholars whose lives touched mine, from the M1s who believed and validated the vision to the M28s who are making their mark, carrying forth the legacy. The Meyer Hall scholars gave me inspiration, validation, determination, strength to fight, and overnight gray hair. <laughs> I want to take a moment to just give you an idea of how one or how a program can be complimented for its good work. And I see it as when it has been replicated. The director of the program, Keith Harmon, and I know they are probably on the books about 12 to 15 schools who are in some way replicating the Meyerhoff program, either entirely or components. Three I will note today that have submitted formal processes for replicating the program. One, Penn State, the other, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and I knew it's Howard University, the Bison STEM Scholars Program with the director, Ron Smith. Ron, would you please stand? Mm -hmm. Thank you. In, here, in Hebrews, we find these words. We entertain angels unaware. They are my angels, the Meyerhoff Scholars. Angels unaware, as seen in their accomplishments, citizenship, and high standards. I close with a final story. I was once asked by the past national president of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, Incorporated, Dr. Thelma Daly, to have a booth about the Meyerhoff Scholars Program at AFRAM in Camden Yards on a Saturday. Michael Hunt, M13, <laughs> volunteered to help me set up the booth at 7 a.m. in the morning. Thousands of people were there that day. I saw maybe eight to 10 at the most. When I returned home around seven that evening, my husband asked, how was the Afram Festival? I said, I had wasted my time, and I only had seen a handful of people. <clears throat> so let's fast forward. When a student is selected to become a Meyerhoff Scholar, they must go through a summer bridge process, and that's actually their initial enrollment. So during Summer Bridge check-in one year, a parent walked up to me and said, do you remember me? You talked to my daughter years ago at AFRAM. She was nine years old, and we never forgot you. And what you told her, she remembered because you explained the Meyerhoff program. We have followed the program over the years. This student became a Meyerhoff Scholar and is presently in a PhD program in mechanical engineering at Georgia Tech. Oh, wow. She asked me to review her application for a fellowship, and I did, and she has received the National Science Foundation Graduate Fellowship for Research. That's big deal. Wow. Big deal.
entertaining angels unaware. I have become, I have come to understand also that in order to attract more of the blessings that life has to offer, one must truly appreciate what they already have. I appreciate what I have and I wait for other life blessings. I entertain angels unaware. What a blessing. Thank you, Legend Committee. Committee. Congratulations to the other honorees. And thank you all for coming today. President, Dr. Freeman Hakosti, CPRA uh, members, Regents of Excellence recipients, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Charles Jao, a UMBC uh, graduate 2005 computer science. It is both an honor and a privilege to introduce to you a role model in public service and a devout academician Dr. Willie B. Lamusa Smith. For the more than three decades that he has been at UMBC, Muse, as I call him, Muse in Swahili means a respected old man. <laughs> Muse has been a tireless supporter and advocate of Africana studies and its students. His contribution to the student body and UMBC as a whole has been invaluable. What makes Dr. Ramusa Smith a are two distinct virtues, kindness and love to help. Working tirelessly to help his students succeed academically. Also, his pioneering spirit and willingness to contribute to the advancement of Redditore New University by using his experience in creating academic programs and programs administration. His belief that every student is talented and gifted and therefore demanding the highest quality of performance from them made his classes interesting and enjoyable. His teaching based on discussion in which each student participated in such a way that they arrived to the right conclusion by argument based on facts was very effective. For those of us who took his classes, he would urge us to push the coconut a little harder. In case you are wondering, he referred to the hand and the brain as coconut, interchangeably. <laughs> I remember one time he invited us, his students, to his home for dinner, and we simply ended, ended up discussing social and economic dynamics of Africa until late in the evening, because the discussion was very interesting and stimulating to the coconut. <laughs> In class, Dr. Ramusa Smith demanded perfection level of performance, and he showed us the way. For example, he required two methods for studying any text. One method he called distillation. In this method, you distilled every paragraph into one sentence, not a summary. If there were 50 paragraphs in the text, you gave him 50 distilled sentences. The second method recorded recorded thesis. He said that every author construct his or her ideas in a series of theses that built up towards a valid conclusion. And so we had to reduce an author's work to its thesis. These exercises were challenging, but they made us apply our coconut to the maximum. <laughs> because of his high expectation, Many UMBC students avoided his classes. <laughs> <laughs> but those of us who braved the classes, we felt rewarded with a more knowledgeable coconut. <laughs> 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 
Dr. Namusa Smith distinguished himself through devotion to students' welfare. He would inquire how we were doing financially, academically, or health-wise. For financial needs, he would make us aware of available scholarship, grants, or work study programs. And on occasion, help raise money to pay students' bills. On academic issues, he would advise us on certain majors or direct, direct us to authorities in other particular majors. Even though Dr. Ramusa Smith was a social studies professor, he was very fond of sciences and encouraged those of us who were pursuing science to carry on. Even though it would have been very easy for him to, to recommend to us the majors he was teaching. If you are having a health issue, Dr. Ramusa Smith would recommend some natural herbs or certain foods. Simply put, there was no way you are going to miss his class for common cold. <laughs> for he would recommend it to you like five remedies, and one of which will work for him. For me, it was a warm apple cider. <laughs> what you don't know about Dr. Ramusa Smith is that after he retired from curing ignorance, he honed his skills, his skills in curing diseases, and he is now a practicing medicine man. <laughs> if you are having any lingering health issue, please see Dr. Ramusa Smith. <laughs> and now, without any further ado, please welcome Dr. Willie B. Ramusa Smith. Thank you very much for a very wonderful, unforgettable introduction. And also thank you very much from my heart for the nomination. President Friedman Ramasi, where is he? <laughs> oh, I cannot see you, the light is blinding me. <laughs> The old man asked me to convey a message to you. I'm happy to deliver the message in the presence of this August Assembly. All the people here, all present here, shall bear witness that I did as the old man wished me to do. Here is the message. You were invited. You came. You created peace, you built, you transformed, you exceeded expectations, you transcended UNBC, you became the most influential person in the world. You molded a veritable new academic community. You are a living legend. You shall be remembered and praised from generation to generation. That's the end of the old man's message. Yeah, now I can talk. 
<laughs> President Drabasi, the UMBC chapter of Black and Latino alumni, Ms. Monique Sebas and the selection committee, Mr. Charles Indau, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. <laughs> when I informed my family of the nomination for the Legends of Award, uh, Legends of Excellence Award, the eldest daughter wrote back, it is long overdue. I responded, longevity with good health is redeeming. <laughs> One of my father's wives once gave me a metaphor. She narrated thus, anytime you are walking past a tree and you see a cat standing high on one of the tree's branches, I'm sure you hardly give the sight any attention. A cat has claws for climbing. On the other hand, when you see a dog standing high on the branch of a tree, you certainly will pause and debate with yourself. How did this dog get up there? You might wonder who strapped the dog on his or her back and climbed up a long ladder and enabled the dog to reach so high. And this metaphor, the dog and its rise is likened to the upward mobility of a human being. Present here this morning or this afternoon are some of the persons who lifted me to the heights and still sustain me up there. Next year, my wife and I will celebrate the 50th anniversary of our marriage. She is the rock and the strength of our family. Without her and our three adorable daughters, I could not have stood high on this, for this long on the branch of a tree. Our second daughter, the chemical engineer, is here with us. Her eldest sister, a physician scientist on the faculty of Columbia University Medical School, and her younger sister, a forensic scientist in the office of the chief medical examiner in New York City, are here with us in spirit. All three of these children had seeds of science as a vocation planted in them by some caring and inspiring UMBC STEM professors. I am extremely grateful that Dr. John L. Johnson and his wife Gladys drove all the way from Virginia to celebrate this special occasion with us. Dr. Johnson brought me and my family into this country in 1970. In 1969, he founded the Afro-American Studies Program at Syracuse University and was its first director. He was also the assistant provost for minority affairs at Syracuse University. He recruited me, his first <coughs> faculty appointee, from Makerere University in Uganda to come help him establish and grow the new program. It did not take too long before our relationship grew from colleagues to family. Our children addressed him Uncle John and his wife Auntie Gladys. Dr. Johnson was a pioneer and a leading forceful advocate in the movement for community education as a solution to the challenges confronting urban education. He and I continue to study and debate issues of significance in the lives of black people. 
He has been a tower holding me up on the tree. Dr. Johnson and Mrs. Johnson, please uh, rise to the right. The nationally recognized success of the African American Studies Program here at UMBC in the 1970s and 80s was a result of the commitment and quality performance of its faculty, plus the extraordinary zeal of its students earnestly eager and hungry for quality college education. We were on a mission a mission to advance and elevate the lives of our students so that they would return to the community and work for its development. One faculty member whose work, whose outstanding commitment was exceptional was Mr. Donald J. Murray, Jr. Mr. Murray, designed and directed the community involvement concentration for Afro-American studies program majors. The concentration with its internship requirement assured full employment of graduate or professional school admission for our graduates. This was an enormous achievement by the program and a credit to UMBC. Mr. Murray also conceptualized, created, and directed the extremely successful summer tutorial project for Baltimore, Baltimore's inner city school children. Additionally, he introduced the annual health fair to UABC and organized it each year, bringing information and services to students and community members. He sustained me on the tree while educating me on the realities of the life chances and experiences of Baltimore's African American families and their families. Don Murray, please stand to be acknowledged. In addition to these three persons that I have introduced, there are present here with me this morning, afternoon, some relatives and friends who have been sources of enduring support. The word education is derived from the Latin verb educare, literally meaning to lead out or draw out or train. Talents and abilities are drawn out of a person through instruction and training. The process is not always easy for both the teacher and the student. However, it is crucially important that regardless of socioeconomic and cultural origins, the rights of racial and ethnic minorities for conditions that are conducive to prospering in the pursuit and cultivation of their faculties and talents are not abridged. I shall end my remarks with a wisdom story from my mother. She told me that when I was a teenager, the story influenced and compelled me not to give up on any student. The story might inspire some parents or educators in this hall this afternoon. Here is the story. Once there lived a prosperous businessman. He had three sons. Two of them followed his, in his footsteps and became wealthy. The third son chose to spend his life on the beach cart wheeling all day, all day long, swimming, diving, and fishing. He lived there by himself 
and considered himself the owner and the ruler of miles of beachfront. One morning, while he was carried wheeling, he noticed three people in the distance walking towards him. As they came closer, he saw that there were three men, including his father. He asked his father what had brought him into the territory, into his territory, and who those two men were. His father replied that he had gone to borrow money for his business, but the economy hadn't been good. The terms for the loan were that he would be sacrificed for a ritual ceremony if he failed to pay back the loan on demand. He had gone to his two wealthy sons, but neither could help him. And so he had come to say farewell to the third son who lived on the beach before his execution by the two men who were walking with him. The son asked the executioners whether the father's story was true. They affirmed it. Whereupon the son told them to look around and see how smooth and undisturbed the sound was all around and how their footsteps had disfigured the shore. He told them to wipe off all their footprints to restore the, sh the shore to the pristine condition created by the ocean waves. If they failed, he was going to drown each of them. After they had tried for hours, hungry, anxious, with nightfall approaching, and realizing that they could not wipe off their footsteps and leave the sand as had been swept by the ocean, they began to beg for their lives. The executioners freed his father. My mother's lesson to me was that just like the eccentric son who saved his father in this story, no person is entirely valueless or innately without talent. The premier duty of educators and parents too is to draw out and cultivate the talents enacted in each and the talents encased in each student within a nurturing and an empathic environment. Thank you very much for your attention. Legends of Excellence honorees. I want to thank everyone. I think I, I speak for everyone when I say that we were moved by all the speeches and the collective impact that you've made at UMBC. But I'm hoping that each of you recognize the far reaches and the impact that you had, not only on those of us who are trying to honor you today, but what we've done as the quote unquote generation of leadership that's coming up now in teaching our young ones the same valuable lessons that you taught us. The actions that you've taken is the template of what the leadership should be. Lessons learned. 
Right now, I want to introduce you to Ms. Monique Cephas, class of 1992 and Legends of Excellence Committee Chairperson. Monique. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. As Janice mentioned, my name is Monique Cephas, and formally to those of you here, Monique Jones, from class of 1992. The development of this program was no easy task, and I would like to thank and recognize the chapter of Black and Latino Alumni Association and the Legends of Excellence nomination and award selection committee for all of the time, great ideas, follow through, and commitment to making the third Legends of Excellence brunch a reality. I would also like to acknowledge Dr. Yvette Mosey Ross, class of 1988, who brought this vision to fruition. And she's gonna kill me right now, but I am a firm believer in giving someone flowers and recognition while they're alive to um, witness it for themselves. So at this time, we do have a bouquet of flowers for you, Yvette, where are you? serving UMBC as the Associate Vice Provost for Enrollment Management. As you can imagine, she was extremely busy, but she still made it her point to attend every meeting and help to guide the committee in this process. For this, we thank her. I would also like to recognize the other members of the chapter of Black and Latino alumni. Please stand if you are in attendance and as your name is called. Abiola Akintolo. Andrea Bobo, yeah. Rabina Chase, Dante Henson, Algerie Stallings, Darren Jazz Stevens. Charmaine Taylor, and our event co-chairpersons, Dr. Tamara Lewis and Spencer Holmes. In addition, I would like to thank the Legends of Excellence Nomination and Award Selection Committee, who were tasked with choosing our award winners from a nomination pool of 12. We know it was not an easy task, in choosing the legends, and we thank them for their service. Those in attendance, please stand. Stacy Bow, Jamila Jackson, Dr. Tamara Lewis, Don Macy, and Keisha Watkins Parker. I would also like to thank Nalisha Spencer and Jacqueline Joy for their work on other event logistics. All the aforementioned helped to make this event a success, and we thank them again for the time and thought they invested in their process. Thank you. And now I would invite Dr. Tamara Lewis to come to the stage at this moment to make a special presentation. Good afternoon again. I'm going to take a moment to deviate from, from Stanielle's well scripted speech for us, um, but I have to take a moment to really thank. Danielle, the Director of Alumni Relations, who has been driving for and behind the chapter of Black and Latino Alumni. So on behalf of CBLA, Danielle, we have a token for you today. I want you all to 
hear something. Usually when you see the black person, they the vice president for minority alumni fair. She vice president, and she is over all alumni. Woo! <laughs> And now I invite our uh, final speaker to the podium to offer a brief closing. Join me in welcoming Spencer Holmes, Legends of Excellence event co-chairperson. Good afternoon. My name is Spencer Holmes, class of 2005, and on behalf of the chapter of Black and Latino alumni, I'd like to thank you for attending and for your support of honorees today. It has been our pleasure to honor these individuals who have had such a tremendous impact on the lives of so many UMBC students during their tenure here on campus. As we welcome to a close, consider the stories you've heard about lives touched, paths nurtured, and relationships cultivated, all started here at UMBC. One of our many roles as alumni is to give back so others can benefit from the stellar education offered at UMBC. To that end, I encourage all guests, alumni, friends, faculty, and staff to consider making a donation in support of the second generation in Esperanza scholarships. Thank you to our generous donors who've already made a gift this fiscal year to the scholarships and other UMBC philanthropic priorities. If you would like to make a first time or additional donation, please vis visit the registration desk in the back. To my fellow alumni, there are many ways to give back and support UMBC students and the alumni community at large. Please refer to our program in the back booklet for more information. If you are currently volunteering, thank you for your service, and we hope you continue to stay connected. For those who aren't, now is your chance. Talk to any of us uh, with a committee ribbon uh, or UMBC staff for more info on ways to get involved. Thank you again for supporting the 2017 Legends of Excellence Brunch. Please enjoy the opportunity to connect and network with other guests. We also have food still out there, so if you guys want to get some before you go, uh, enjoy. Thank you very much. Thank you.